right. I want you to stand up real quick because it looks like you're getting a little sleepy out there. I want you to stand up real quick. Just stand up, all right? All right, a little spiritual aerobics here, all right? <laughs> just turn to the person that's beside you or just a couple down and, and, and just say, hey, listen, God loves you. Just do that real quick and I love you. God loves you and I love you, all right? It's just get a little blood flowing here. We got a little quiet during that other video and I hope you are excited about that as I am and again that you are here, all right? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. All right. If you love the Lord today, say hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right. Have a seat right there. All right. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to the book of Romans. All right. We're running a little bit farther behind today, but we're going to jump into this. our first day. So we're beginning this series, right? This new series on grace as we're going to be going through the book of Romans. All right. And uh, my, my, my plan is to be in Romans the whole year of 2019. All right. That's the plan, right? Hopefully, like, who knows, something could come along and say, hey, well, you need to do this on that day. You know, we do have some special dates here and there, but that's the plan, all right? So I want to encourage you to be into the book of Romans. I, I hope you have a, a reading plan where you're reading the Bible already, but I hope you spend some extra time into the book of Romans, all right? And be reading there and kind of follow along and uh, just kind of getting more and more familiar with what Paul says here in this book. You know, he talks a lot about grace. It's not 100% about grace as you go through the Bible, but we see God's grace working through it as you go through Romans and just give God the praise for all those things. And let's just uh, be focused, right? Let's be focused on what his word has to say. I just want us to go deeper into this as we're here in the, in the book of Romans. Uh, I, I'm excited about this. This past week, I got to sit down and I kind of wrote out already four or five outlines. Uh, and I'm still in chapter one, right? And so probably have about six messages coming from chapter one of Romans, right? And, uh, and then, again, we're looking at 52 messages coming out of this book throughout this year. And so be praying for me as I am... Uh, preparing and studying, and I'll be praying for you as you're reading the Word of God as well, and seeing how uh, God can be speaking to you through that, all right? So we're talking about grace, mainly, here in the book of Romans, but let me ask you this question as we're beginning, all right? And kind of asked you this a little bit earlier as we had sung that song, Heaven Came Down, but do you remember, you, do you remember when you received God's grace? Right? You remember that? You remember his saving grace when you accept it and you know what that is all about? That's when you, you're, you're beginning to trust, you trust God and, and you're asking him to be your savior and your God and asking him to come into your heart and that's when you're asking him to forgive you of your sins and at that moment, you know, he gives us grace, right? By taking away our sins is something you know, that, that we couldn't go out and work for or buy or anything else. It had to come from Him. And He gave us grace at that moment of salvation. And He put His Holy Spirit within our lives. You remember that? And that was, was that a great moment in your life? Right? Do you remember that during that time, can you kind of look back at those moments in your life and kind of remember how a change began to take place? Can you remember that? Your life began to change, right? Because, man, because when you come to Christ, you are a new creation, right? Old's gone, new's come, right? That's what Scripture tells us, what Paul tells us in Corinthians. And, and so when we come to know God and we receive that grace that only He can give us, and there is that spiritual change that begins to take place. And spiritual life comes. And the Holy Spirit is then within us and helping us to grow and to become more and more like God. At least that's what is to take place, right? So we understand what grace is. It's God's undeserved gift toward us, right? His free gift, right? You can't buy it, right? You can't go get it from a store. You can't order it online from Amazon, right? It's free. It's free. Because of what Jesus did on the cross, 
And when you have faith in Him and you accept Him, He gives us that grace, right? That only He can give. We don't deserve it. None of us deserve it. And we'll never deserve it. I don't care how long you, you, you remain a, as a Christian, and from here to the rest of your life, you, go to, you still won't deserve it. But all because of that great love of the Lord, He gives us that grace, right? He saves us. But you have to understand something as we think about it. Grace goes far beyond just salvation. Okay? Grace goes with you every day of your life, helping you as you continue to trust God and to grow in the Lord and to be used by the Lord. God gives us that grace, especially as we're staying true to Him, we're being obedient to Him, we're following Him as we should. And when there's those moments in life when it seems like, God, I don't know how I can do this, I don't know how I'm going to get through this, God's grace is there, right? Again, you don't deserve that. But God, through His great love and mercy, He gives us His grace. Now, if you've received grace, what have you been doing with it? What have you been doing with that grace that God has given you? More than just, yeah, He saved you. But especially now that He wants to use you, right? What are you doing with that grace? Do you understand? Do you understand that without grace, we don't stand a chance? Do you understand that? We don't stand a chance in this life. There's no hope without grace, and it all comes from the Lord. We don't stand a chance. Do you understand that without grace, we're completely lost, and we're on our way to hell? Right? And every person in the world today that hasn't experienced that grace, that's where they're headed. Until they come to know Christ, they put trust and faith in Him, and He distributes and bestows grace into their life. Until that moment, listen, we're just completely lost and helpless, and we have no chance in this life to spend an eternity with God. That's God's grace. So you think about it, if you've received grace as a believer, God didn't just give it to you for you just to sit still, but he wants to use you and he will give you the grace that you need in every possible way that he wants to use you, he will give it to you. So what are you doing with the grace that God's given you? What are you doing with it? But for a lot of times, I even think that maybe there's many people who sit within the sanctuary and they'll sing that song that we've sung a million times. The Amazing Grace. Love that song. Powerful song. And, and still not truly understand what it's all about. Just kind of go through the motions. Just kind of do some lip service. And, and just say the words. And, and, and still not truly understand what it's all about. We receive the grace that God has to offer us for salvation, and, and we want that grace to help us in everything else in life, but we take it all for granted. So many times we abuse it. What God has given us, and instead of really allowing God to work through us and to use that grace that He's given us to serve Him and to impact His kingdom, we just kind of Think, well, we throw it around kind of flippantly here and there. Oh, grace, yeah, love it, grace, yeah, grace. And we just don't treat God's grace, that greatest gift you can ever receive from God through His Son, Jesus Christ. Here in the book of Romans that we're looking at, Paul is writing to the church of Rome, right? He's writing to the church of Rome. You see that there in those first seven verses we're going to look at today. He's writing to them, and you have to understand the church of Rome. Picture this. During this time, the church of Rome and, and Rome in itself and what that's like, the church of Rome is nothing like us. It's nothing like us. 
It's not where I come to church on a Sunday morning, I sit in the pews, I sing a few songs, put a few bucks in the plate, and I hear a good message, and I go home. It's nothing like us. This is the church of Rome. And you understand what's happening in Rome. Man, it is a place that is so wicked and evil and immoral. It is a place of polytheism, the worship of many gods. It is a place of wicked and evil Caesars and emperors, right? It is a place that's just trying to dominate the entire world. It is a place where Christ is hated. And any person professing to be a Christian is hated as well. It is a place where if you are a Christian and is found out, you would be persecuted. It is a place where the persecution would lead to you being beaten, you being thrown in prison, you being set on fire to be burned as a candlelight in a garden party. It's a place where Christians are thrown into the lions as entertainment for all the other citizens of Rome that's come to watch the Christians be devoured. That's Rome. That's the church that Paul is speaking about as he writes this great letter of Romans. Christians being humiliated and persecuted and just being completely destroyed. But think about this. The church in Rome, in the midst of of all the persecution, in the midst of all the hardship, they're not just existing. They are surviving and they're thriving. Because there are many Christians right there in the midst of all the suffering. And what is it that helps them continue to live for the Lord and to stay true to Him in the midst of all this suffering? It's God's grace. It's God's grace. Amen. That's with them every step of the way. When they are beaten, God's grace helps them. When they are thrown in prison, God's grace is right there. When they are lit on fire, burned alive as torches for a garden party, God's grace. When they are thrown to be eaten alive by the lions, God's grace is there. And the church continues. Paul is writing this letter to those who are suffering for the Lord. That's the church in Rome, as it was in so many other places during the early Christian church. Listen, we don't know what that's like. We don't understand that. Because we've never suffered like that. You know what I believe? I believe we need to suffer. I believe it do us good to be persecuted. I believe we need a fire lit under our feet to help us truly understand what we have been given when it comes to grace. And to understand the great cost that God paid so that we could have it. We don't understand it. We think we do. We pretend to understand it, but we don't understand what that grace is all about. God's grace. Paul here in Romans, he begins his letter by saying that he is this servant of God. There in verse 1. He said he's a servant of God. And it is that word from the Greek meaning doulos, which means he is a bond servant. Meaning he has made himself a slave to Christ. He is sold out to Christ. The only thing that matters is Christ. The only thing he's concerned with is Christ in the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is all that he is concerned with. He has died to himself. He's made himself a bond servant. Listen, he, meaning slave. It wasn't, you know what a bond servant was in scripture? It was when you had been given your freedom as a slave, but you said no to the master. I'm going to stay with you and I'm going to keep serving you. It's a decision that you make. Listen, I want to be your slave. And Paul says, listen, I am a servant of Jesus Christ. I'm a doulos. I'm a bondservant. I'm a slave. 
to the one who died for me, to the one who gave me grace, right? That's what Paul begins this whole letter with, stating his only purpose in life is to preach the gospel, the story of Jesus. Nothing else matters. Listen, all his worldly obligations, they don't matter. Because Christ is what matters. The gospel is what matters. All of his personal desires and his wants of life, they don't matter. <laughs> It's all about that one who gave him grace. It's all about that one who loved him the most, who died for him on the cross to save him from his sins. That's all Paul is concerned about. Nothing else matters. It's not about his plans. It's not about what he thinks he needs to do or the mundane things of life. It's not about his pleasures. It's all for God. That's Paul's whole mindset of the grace that he has received from Jesus Christ. And listen, if we could just get a little bit of that mentality, if we could just start getting there a couple steps at a time, man, what a difference that would begin to make in your life, in my life, in the life of the entire church. What a difference that when we could understand, man, God gave me grace. So listen, I'm going to be like Paul. I want to be that bond servant. I want to be that slave to Jesus Christ. Paul's whole life was for one purpose, and that's to preach the gospel. But for us, what do we do? We let all the junk of life, all the busyness of life, all these little personal obligations get in the way so that we put the one who gave us grace in the back seat. And everything else takes priority over the one who gave you grace. Paul talks about this was a gospel that was mentioned by the prophets before it even took place. He's speaking of those Old Testament prophets that speak of the coming of Christ, the, the incarnation of Christ, the advent of Christ, how he's going to come, how he's going to be the Messiah, how he's going to die on the cross, how he's going to be resurrected. Paul says, listen, this is the gospel that I'm committed to, that I'm a servant of, that I've been called to, that I'm an apostle of, because of the grace of God that was preached and taught way back there, prophesied way back there, that is now being fulfilled, and now I'm preaching it, and I'm teaching it, all because of the grace. Amen. Paul says, that's what it's all about. So he was committed 100%. 100%. You may say, well, Curtis, that's the Apostle Paul. That, that's not us. Listen, that is to be for every believer, every Christian that God bestows grace on, that we are to be 100% committed to him, to be a bond servant, a slave, a sold out to him 100% where nothing else gets in the way. It's not just for Paul. It's for the church. And that's you and I who say we have received that. We let too much get in the way and fill our lives and too much of the world and too much of the junk. And we can't sell out to God because of that. We can't sell out. Galatians 2.20, Paul says, I am crucified in Christ. And I no longer live. But Christ lives in me. Because of the grace, he died to himself. Listen, the, the gospel about Jesus, where it says it was approved, he was designated, or, or that he was proved that, that he was the Son of God. Because of the power that was seen from the resurrection from the dead. Paul says, that's the gospel he's preaching. And because of that, he, he has no doubt of who Jesus is, who God is where his grace comes from. So he is a slave. He is sold out 100%, he says. Because of that grace. Why is he so committed? Think about who Paul was before he came to know Christ. 
Think about who Paul was before he received that grace, right? He was, yeah, he was committed to the law. He had this misunderstanding of who Christ was. So what did he do? He, he was a Christ hater himself. He persecuted any Christian he could find. He went searching for them to throw them into prison. He even sat there and gave approval for Stephen to be stoned to death. That's who Paul was. But now he's so committed. Now he is one of them because of the grace that God has given him. Now he's a slave and he's died to himself because he knows that Jesus is the Savior. That Jesus is the one who could give him the grace to have true, eternal life. And he's the same one who gives us grace. Look at those first seven verses there. Paul, a servant of Jesus, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him we receive grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith for his name's sake. And you also are among those Gentiles who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. In verse 7, to all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be his holy people, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. This is Paul who was once a persecutor of Christians, but now who is one who has received the gospel, who has received the grace, and he's made a 180 degree turn about, and he's serving Jesus with everything he has because of God's grace through Jesus Christ. Here's the main point today is this, to remember where we receive our grace from. We receive grace through Christ. Right? Grace comes from through Christ because of the work that he did on the cross. We can receive grace from God because of him. <coughs> right? Paul says he, he's a servant of Jesus. He's all about the gospel of Jesus who is the son of God and who was raised from the dead. And now he tells us that it is through Jesus that we receive that free gift. When we receive that gift that we cannot pay for or earn, it is that gift of grace. Listen, the only way Paul could have ever been an apostle of God the only way Paul could have ever made an impact on the kingdom of God was first he had to receive grace. Grace always comes before you're able to be saved, you're able to be used, you're able to make an impact on the kingdom of God, to make an impact in people's lives. You need God's grace. It says that we are saved by grace through faith, right, in Ephesians 2, 9. So grace comes first. And as that grace comes in because of our faith in Him, then God's able to change us, make us a new creation. And God's grace comes when you receive spiritual gifts. It's God's grace that gives that to you. And when you're able to be used to make a difference and to grow and to overcome any kind of obstacles or hardships you face in life, it's all because of the grace that you've already received that helps you to do those things. So the only way we can be used, the only way we can be changed, it's because of that grace. My question is this. Knowing that we've received the greatest gift ever, and it is from God through Christ, why don't we do more than what we do? Knowing that the King of Kings, right? who loved us so much and died for us and it was resurrected from the dead and ascended into heaven and is coming again, knowing that he gives you grace that you don't deserve. Why don't we do more? As individuals, as people say, yes, I received grace. 
as a church, why don't we do more? Why do we just sit around and think, man, yeah, I'm just going to allow the world and allow this life and, and the busyness of life and the chaos of this life get in the way. Listen, you've been given grace. What more do you want? Amen. What more do you want? The greatest gift that can ever be given to you from God is grace that leads you to your salvation. Yet we live as if it's not enough and we keep asking God to do more for us and we keep seeking for what the world has to offer us at the very same time. We need to be given grace. We should be jumping out of the bed every morning and thanking God, what can I do for you today? How can I serve you today? How can I make an impact for your kingdom today? God, you gave me grace. You saved me. You gave me something I don't deserve. And, and, and because of that, I'm so grateful. And just as Paul had died to self, crucified for Christ, become a bond servant for Christ, we should be the very same. God, what, what do you want from me today? Instead, we get up and we think of our own personal wants and our own personal needs and our own little obligations, thinking that those things are so, so important for us. And we allow this world to just take control of us instead of remembering, listen, I've been saved by grace through the one true God of the universe. And that is all that should matter. Amen. That's all that should matter. I don't care if you're young or if you're 80 years old. That's all that should matter. That's what Paul focused on. Listen, that's what the church of Rome was focused on. You gave me grace, so now I'm going to serve you with every ounce of my life. Grace through Jesus who died for you. <clears throat> There's nothing greater, church. It should change everything about us, the whole way that we think, the whole way that we live. It should change everything. Because of that, we should be like Paul who says, I'm going to just pour myself out. It's all about you. It's all about you. Wherever I go, whatever I'm doing, it's all about you. And that's all that matters. There's three good truths that Paul speaks to us about, about this grace. Look at verses 5 and 6. Through him we receive grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to the all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith for his namesake. And you also are among those Gentiles who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. Three things he said there. You see them? This is grace demands obedience. Grace demands faith. And grace is for all, he says. You got it? If you have grace... He says he's calling them to obedience, right? Through faith. So you see those two things. He said, if you receive grace, listen, there's got to be some obedience there. Obedience to God and what he says to you, what he calls you to do, what he demands of you. Obedience to how he says, I want to use you here and I want you to do this. Instead, so many times we say, God, I, I, I'd love to do that, but i got other things right now on my plate. But God, I'll obey you later in this. But an obedience that leads to God pouring out His grace in your life and His obedience that will become because you had faith in Him, right? See, when you came to know Jesus, you were saying, Jesus, I have faith in You. Jesus, I trust You. Jesus, I give You my life because I trust You and I believe You died on the cross and I believe You were resurrected from the dead and I believe that salvation only comes from You in the name of Jesus and none other and I believe that You will give me grace and so You said, I trust You. What's happened to that faith? That faith to where God was able to pour out His grace into your life? What's happened to that? That now we say, God, yeah, I, I'm glad for the grace of salvation, but it's going to stop right there. I'm not going to trust you as much anymore. Listen, if you receive grace, man, it's obedience in his faith every day of your life. And it is a grace that's for all. Paul says he was there to call all Gentiles, all Gentiles who would believe, right? Right? To obedience through faith. It's not just for a select few. It's not just for a few 
predetermined. It's for you and it's not for you. It's for you and it's to know. It's for all who believe, who hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and as they're drawn by the Holy Spirit to him that they receive and they accept it and they believe and they begin to trust him. For all men, isn't that a great gift? To know that every person out there in this world, God's gracious for them. I don't know if you know it, but past month, we've had vandalism taking place here at the church. But you know what? God's grace is for them. As much as it may irritate me when that happened, God's grace is there. It doesn't matter. For those people over in that jail across the road, God's grace is for them. For all the people who are living around us, all the immorality that's taking place that contradicts the word of God, God's grace is for them. If they would hear it and believe it, and as God draws them, they would listen to him. God's grace is for all those are three truths of grace that we must remember. But again, come back to the question, what are you doing with the grace that you received? What are you doing with it? That you have received through Christ because you said you had faith. What are you doing with that grace? Paul used his grace to die to himself. He used his grace to sell out to God, to be a servant, a slave, even when he was being beaten, even when he was thrown in prison, even when he was left for dead. Outside of CPS. And even when, even when he was put in prison and brought to have his head taken off, he still sold out to God. The Church of Rome, the very same thing. The one this letter goes to, they knew they received grace, and God. Help them through everything they faced. Even when it meant their life and many of them lost their lives. Because of God's grace, they did not stop. And they continued going forward. And the gospel continued going forward. What are you doing with the grace that you have received? I guess the last question would be, Have you received God's grace? Have you received it? Have you turned to God? Have you said, God, I have faith in you, I believe in you, I want to obey you and accept you as my Savior, and he bestows his grace in you, and he saves you? Have you? I hope that you have. That's the greatest gift we could ever receive. The grace that comes through Jesus. Right? You know, as we continue to talk about this throughout this year, I just want you and I to understand how great this gift is. And that we don't take it for granted anymore. And that we don't keep living life as if, ah, uh, you know, I've got saving grace. I think that's all I need. Because that's not where God's called you to. His salvation for you through his grace was the first step. And now he wants to give you your grace. He had to help you through life and all the hardships. But most of all, he wants to give you grace to be used for building his kingdom. And that's what we're all called to. Amen? Stand with me here. Just for a moment, heads bowed, eyes closed. Maybe you think, you know, I, I haven't been thinking about grace in that way. Yeah, I, I knew it was grace that saved me, but I haven't thought how important that grace plays in my everyday life and how great a price God paid so that I could have his grace. And no, I haven't sold myself out to God. No, I've allowed 
the obligations of life to get in the way. And I haven't been obedient. I put other things before God. When because of His grace He gives me, He should be first in every single thing, in every single day. Knowing that every breath I take, it comes from Him. The life I have is because of Him. And so I want to be like Paul as much as possible. I want to be like those in the Church of Rome and other parts of that time that were persecuted, even those who are persecuted today because of their faith. And say, no matter what happens, because God gave His grace to me, I will just keep pouring myself out for Him. Maybe that's where we need to be today. Again, I really believe. I believe we do need to experience some suffering, some persecution. And maybe then we'll begin to appreciate what God's done for us. But I do believe that many, if that happens and when it happens, there'll be many who will not be able to stand under it. Because we've made it so cheap all our lives and not understood what God has given us. I pray today you'd help us. Help us to understand that grace that comes through Christ, that calls for obedience, faith that's for all, to understand how important and how costly that was for you. How dear it should be to us that we sell ourselves out for you from this moment on. Anyone here today who hasn't received your grace, I pray conviction will be poured out. I pray your Holy Spirit would grip their heart. I pray they would hear you speak. They would have faith in you and begin to follow you and you would give them grace that will save them. And grace that will strengthen them. And lead them to a time of transformation. Lead them to following you and being sold out and giving their whole heart to you every single day of their life. Help that to be true of me. Help it to be true of my brothers and sisters here today. That you may be glorified.